thank you for joining Wars of the Roses as we conclude with part 22 of Dr. R. Swinburne Climber's Ancient Mystic Oriental Masonry. Rules and regulations governing the members of the Ancient and Mystic Oriental Rite adopted in secret council held in the East in the year of our Lord, 1906. Rules are absolutely binding on all lodges and its members under the Supreme Grand Lodge jurisdiction. Rules 1. The whole world is but one republic of which each nation is a family, and each individual a child. Masonry, and especially mystic masonry, not in any wise derogating from the differing duties which the diversity of states require, tends to create a new people, a new association, a universal brotherhood which, composed of men of many nations and tongues, shall all be bound together by the bonds of science, morality, virtue, and brotherly love. 2. The real object of mystic masonry can be summed up in these words. To efface from among men the prejudice of caste, the conventional distinctions of color, origin, opinion, nationality, to annihilate fanaticism and superstition, extirpate national discord, and with it extinguish the firebrand of war, in a word, to arrive by free and pacific progress at one formula or model of eternal and universal right, according to which each individual human being shall be free to develop every faculty with which he may be endowed, and to concur heartily and with all the fullness of his strength in the bestowment of happiness upon all, and thus to make of the whole human race one family of brothers united by affection, wisdom, and labor, and to bind them together in such a way that it shall be impossible for one brother to hurt another in any possible way. 3. Masonic charity and devotion being the duty of brothers, whosoever shall be convicted of having had projects or acts trending to lower the order or attack a brother's honor, shall, by the very deed, be brought before the committee, appointed in such cases, and if found guilty, shall not only be expelled, but shall be made to suffer the full penalty as such act is prescribed by the secret code. There can be no exceptions to these rules and laws, for to do so were to weaken the very foundation of mystic and oriental masonry. 4. When the calamities of our brother call for our aid, we should not withdraw the hand that must sustain him from sinking, but we should render him those services which, not encumbering or entering our families or fortunes, charity and religion, may dictate for the saving of our fellow being, nor may we draw the line too closely in our favor. Mystic masonry, if for anything, is to bind its members together in one bond which cannot be severed by any force whatever. 5. For this purpose, indolence dare not persuade the foot to halt or wrath turn our steps out of the way, but forgetting injuries and selfish feelings, and remembering that man was born for the aid of his generation and not for his own enjoyment only, but to do that which is good, we must be swift to have mercy, to save, to strengthen, and to execute benevolence. 6. As the good things of this life are partially dispensed, and some are opulent while others are in distress, such principles also enjoy mystic masons, even if so poor, to testify their good will towards each other. Riches alone do not allow the means of doing good. Virtue and benevolence alone are not confined to the walks of opulence. The rich man, from his many talents, is required to make extensive works under the principles of virtue, and yet, Poverty is no excuse for an omission of that exercise, for as the cry of innocence ascendeth up to heaven, as the voice of babes and sucklings reach the throne of God, and as the breathings of a contrite heart are heard in the regions of dominion, so a mystic's prayer, devoted to the welfares of his brother, are required of him. 7. Another principle is never to injure the confidence of your brother by revealing his secrets 
for perhaps that were to rob him of the guard which protects his property or life. The tongue of a mystic mason must be void of offense and without gall towards a brother, speaking truth with discretion and keeping itself with the rule of judgment, maintaining a heart void of uncharitableness, locking up secrets and communicating in charity and love. 8. So much is required of the mystic mason in his gifts as discretion shall limit. Charity begins at home, but like a fruitful olive tree planted by the side of a fountain whose boughs overshot the wall, so is charity. It spreads in arms abroad from the strength and opulence of its station and bendeth its shade for the repose and relief of those who are gathered under its branches. Charity, when given with imprudence, is no longer a virtue, but when flowering with abundance, it is glorious as the beams of the morning in whose beauty thousands rejoice. When donations extorted by pity are detrimental to a man's family, they become sacrifices to superstition and like incense to idols are disapproved by heaven. 9. In the intercourse with the world, we must carefully guard ourselves against depreciating any brother of the order, no matter what his faults may be. We must not let any words of ill will fall from our lips relating to the members of our fraternity. If, from motives of jealousy at our success and progress, they choose to be antagonistic to us, let all the aggressive acts be on the other side. For if mystic masons disagree amongst themselves and make their discretions matters of public notary, what opinions of us can we expect from the outer world? And how can it believe in our profession of brotherly love, friendship, and the universal brotherhood of man? 10. As the ancient mystic oriental masons of the universe consider the Blue Lodge or ancient craft masonry the foundation and fundamental basis of our institution, to which the Masonic allegiance of all its members is due, and from which there can be no deviation. Therefore, no Mason can be allowed to join the ancient mystic oriental rite of the universe unless he is a member of some ancient free and accepted Masonic body. 11. Initiates of mystic and oriental masonry are ordered to fraternize with the members of all other rites. Tolerance is not only written at the head of all its sacred law, but is an absolute and unbreakable rule. There is but one exception to this rule. No mystic mason can, under any circumstance, recognize the member of any Masonic body in which the G does not hold a prominent place. In such cases, Masonic rule is broken, and in this respect, Albert G. Mackey, the highest Masonic authority on the continent of America, in his Masonic jurisprudence says, Within the past few years, an attempt has been made by some Grand Lodges to add to these simple, moral and religious qualifications another which requires a belief in the divine authenticity of the scriptures. It is much to be regretted that Masons will sometimes forget the fundamental law of their institution and endeavor to add or to detract from the perfect integrity of the building as it was left to them by their predecessors. Whenever this is done, the beauty of our temple must suffer. The landmarks of Masonry are so perfect that they neither need nor or will permit the slightest amendment. 12. The G in the Masonic institution is the oldest landmark the institution has, and to take this away is to break Masonic rule. It is unmasonic, and any Grand Lodge doing this is not only unmasonic, but becomes, by that very act, spurious or clandestine masonry. This is Masonic law, it cannot be broken. Note, G. This letter is deservedly regarded as one of the most sacred of the Masonic emblems, where it is used, however, as a symbol of deity. It must be remembered that it is a Saxon representative of the Hebrew Yod and the Greek Tau the initial letters of the name of the Eternal in those languages. This symbol proves that Freemasonry always prosecuted its labors with reference of grand ideals of infinity and eternity by the letter G, which conveys to the minds of the brethren 
at the same time the idea of God and that of geometry. It bound heaven to earth, the divine to the human, and the infinite to the finite. Masons are taught to regard the universe as the grandest of all symbols, revealing to men in all ages the ideals which are eternally revolving in the mind of the divinity, and which it is their duty to reproduce in their own lives and in the world of art and industry. Thus, God and geometry, the material worlds and the spiritual spheres were constantly united in the speculations of the ancient masons. They consequently labored earnestly and unwordly, not only to construct cities and embellish them with magnificent edifices, but also to build up a temple of great and divine thoughts and of ever-growing virtues for the soul to dwell in. The symbolical letter G, that hieroglyphical bright which none but craftsmen ever saw and before which every true mason reverently uncovers and bows his head. It is a perpetual condemnation of profanity, impurity, and vice. No brother who has bowed before that emblem can be profane. He will never speak the name of the Grand Master of the Universe but with reverence, respect, and love. He will learn by studying the mystic meaning of the letter G to model his life after the divine plan, and thus instructed, he will strive to be like God in the activity and earnestness of his benevolence and the broadness and efficiency of his charity. The letter G occupies a prominent position in several of the degrees in the American system, is found in many of the degrees of the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite in Adon Haramite masonry, and in fact is one of the many systems in which the people of the 16th and 17th century were so prolific in manufacturing. Whenever we find this recondite symbol in any of the Masonic rites, it has the same significance, a substitute for the Hebraic, Jod, the initial letter of the divine name and a monogram that expresses the uncreated being, principle of all things, and enclosed in a triangle, the unity of God. We recognize the same letter G in the Syriac Gad, the Swedish Good, the German Gata, and the English God, all names of the deity, and all derived from the Persian Gada, itself derived from the absolute pronoun signifying himself. 13. It is an absolute rule that the ritual must be used in all initiation work. This is nothing new even among craft masonry, says a member of the Belgium Lodge. Our lodge, called La Charity, at Orient Chalera is under obedience of the Great Orient at Brussels and has the Scottish Rite. No Mason is supposed to know anything of the ritual by heart. Questions and answers are read out, especially at initiation. The work of the Mason is supposed to be interior work in himself before it can become external labor, so in order to obtain his degrees, he has to do some work of his own, and no one is supposed to learn anything by heart except words, signs, and passwords. Now I have to tell you that every mason is supposed to do some literary work on general subjects concerning the welfare of man, human institutions, sociology, history, philosophy, philanthropy, etc., and it is such work that a young mason is supposed to do. Then, after reading these papers, they are discussed by all the members of the lodge present, perhaps for three or four meetings, until the subject seems to be exhausted. This develops in the young mason, his intelligence and his moral feeling. According to this, it is not forbidden in craft masonry to use the rituals during labor and the supreme lodge of ancient and oriental mystic masonry now makes it an absolute rule that all lodges must use the ritual during labor. There can be no exceptions to this rule. To disobey means the revocation of the charter of such lodge. 14. Whosoever wishes to be admitted to the secrets and afterward to be initiated must be a man of honor and of true spiritual power. He must already be of some learning in the mysteries concerning initiation, 
for only those will be accepted who will be of service to the great work. It will be necessary that he shall be a member of the M. C. E. Have taken the obligation as a brother and have his name enrolled among that order. After this is done, he can make application for initiation into the lodge. 15. The Supreme Grand Master or his deputy has authority and right not only to be present in any true lodge, but also to preside wherever he is with the master of the lodge on his left hand and to order the other officers to do such duty as he may wish. 16. The master of a particular lodge has the right and authority of congregating the members of his lodge into a chapter at pleasure upon any emergency or occurrence as well as to appoint the time and place of their usual meeting. In case of the sickness of the master, no lodge can be opened. In the case of the death of the master of any of the other officers, the deputy grand master will appoint a successor. 17. The master of each particular lodge shall keep a book containing their bylaws, the names of their members, with a list of other lodges in such state or country. A copy of the secret laws shall also be kept in such lodge, and each member must possess a copy of such secret laws. 18. No man can be made or admitted a member of a particular lodge without previous notice one month before given to the said lodge. In order to make due inquiry into the reputation and capacity of the candidate, unless by special dispensation, no man can be admitted or made unless he first becomes a member of the 19. The candidate shall solemnly promise to submit to the constitutions, the charters, regulations, and other usages as shall be intimated to him in time and place convenient. 20. No set or number of brethren shall withdraw or separate themselves from the lodge in which they were made brethren, or were afterwards admitted members unless the lodge becomes too numerous, nor even then without a dispensation from the Supreme Grand Master, and when they are thus separated, they must either immediately join themselves to such other lodge as they shall be ordered, or else they must obtain the Supreme Grand Master's warrant to join in forming a new lodge. 21. If any number of brethren shall take upon themselves to form a lodge without the Supreme Grand Master's warrant, the regular lodges are not to countenance them, nor own them as fair brethren and duly formed, but treat them as rebels. It will be impossible that this should happen, for the reason that the brethren can only reach the Supreme Grand Master through the deputy, and since not even the masters of lodges can come into direct contact with the unknown Supreme Grand Master. And since no one but the candidate for the highest degrees can know the Supreme Grand Master, it will be impossible to form such clandestine lodges, since their very support and source of light would be totally cut off from them. Besides this, the secret code absolutely forbids this and under the obligation that each brother takes before he can be admitted even to the first degree of mystic masonry, he can never betray either a brother or the lodge to which he belongs, much less the Supreme Grand Lodge. 22. If any brother so far misbehaves himself as to render his lodge uneasy, he shall be admonished by the master in the formed lodge, and if he will not refrain from his imprudence and obediently submit to the advice of his brethren and reform what gives them offense, he shall be dealt with accordingly to the secret rules, for the lodge of mystic masonry combines both the church and the academy and the brethren meet for instruction and worship. Therefore, no in harmony can be allowed to prevail. 23. All lodges are to observe the same usages as much as possible. In order to do this, and for cultivating a good understanding among mystic masons, some members out of every lodge shall be deputed to visit other lodges as often as shall be thought convenient, and each lodge, or several may combine, may form a college for secret instruction of its members. 
27, the Supreme Grand Lodge consists of the unknown Supreme Grand Master, the Supreme Grand Master, the Supreme Grand Deputy, the Grand Secretary, the Grand Deputies of the State, and the Secret Teacher or Hierophants of the Higher Degrees. The brethren who come into touch with the Hierophants are absolutely forbidden as per their obligation to ever reveal the abiding place of any Hierophant. 25. The Supreme Grand Master holds such position for life and selects his own deputy, secretary, deputies, and other officers. He may resign and appoint his own successor and each new Supreme Grand Master has the authority to formulate his own rules and regulations with the exception of the secret rules. He can choose his own seal and even change the name of the order. He must, however, retain all deputies who have proven proficient under former Supreme Grand Masters, and he cannot, under any circumstance, change the Grand Hierophants. He cannot change any of the degrees nor any of the lodges. Each Supreme Grand Master must select his successor immediately after he takes charge of his office and such a one he selects must be under his instructions for no less than 10 years unless, as it sometimes happens, that the Supreme Grand Master meets with an untimely death, the one who then succeeds. Him in office cannot, under his obligation, cause any inharmony in the order. 26. The Supreme Grand Master issues all dispensations and warrants for lodges throughout the known world. He shall keep a book or appoint a secretary to keep such book, wherein be recorded all the lodges with their usual times and places of meeting, and the names of all the members of each lodge, and all the affairs of the Supreme Grand Lodge that are proper to be written. Such books must be kept in the secret archives of the order, together with all such other secret manuscripts and documents as may come into the possession of the Supreme Grand Body. 27. The Supreme Grand Master cannot abuse his power, even with his almost unlimited authority, for the reason that the Grand Hierophants and the Great White Brotherhood are above him in authority, and he is always held accountable to them for anything that he may do. Thank you for watching, and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment, and if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Rosies. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.